everybody and welcome back to my channel. So it's Sunday morning, August the 7th. Uh, I just got out of the shower, just washed my hair. But um, I had planned to put on, style my hair and put on makeup and get in the kitchen today. You can see I've got some things laid out. I've got a, a pan there. I'm getting ready to bake an apple cake and I got my head of, half a head of cabbage over there, my apples. Hopes to get in the kitchen today and, and cook. I really enjoyed my dinner last night at the, the fried okra and the chicken thigh and the baked potato. And I have the plate in the refrigerator just to heat up for my dinner tonight. And thank you all so much for watching that video and for all of the nice comments that you left. Many of you asked me, what does okra taste like? Well, I can't compare it to anything. I have my favorite vegetable of all is artichoke. I just love artichoke. It's it's a delicacy for me. And I guess uh, okra would be the, my second favorite. But it has a mild taste. It, it's not overwhelming or strong like Brussels sprouts or, or broccoli or cabbage or anything. And if you haven't tried it, I encourage you to do so. But don't boil it and don't, <laughs> mama used to cook it, and I have cooked it a few times, sauteed in a skillet with um, tomatoes and onions and, and okra, and it does get slimy if you boil it. I also put a little bit of it in my shrimp and chicken gumbo, but I don't like, I don't, I don't mind it being slimy. You know, I grew up eating it like that, so I'm used to it. For y'all that wouldn't like that slimy texture, I do encourage you to fry it. and. You can find it fresh. They usually package it, put it in a little package with a cellophane wrapper, and you can buy it fresh and then slice it up, and it'll be nice and dry. You know, you won't have to dry it like I did this frozen package. They even sell it with the breading on it. The easiest way, if you want the easy way to cook it and just to try it if you've never, if you've never tasted it before and you just want to try it, well then try the the package that's already breaded. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is how embarrassed and how ashamed I am. And how I can't, I can't fix it. You know, there's just, I have a mental illness and and this is a result of it, and, and I can't fix it. I've tried, I've tried for at least 40 or 50 years, you know, to stop it, and, and I just can't stop it. And that's this, the dermatillomania. My poor arms are just covered in sores, raw open sores, scars all over my arms where I have picked my whole life. It's so embarrassing. I've lied about it and made up excuses for it and said all kinds of stuff trying to cover up what it is, but it, it is what it is. It's, it's a mental illness and it's called dermatillomania. And I guess what made me really focus on it is um, when I was babysitting the other day and Poor little Ife went and got her little stool and climbed up into mommy's medicine cabinet and got out Jill's tube of Voltaren cream that she had bought to use on her bursitis. And Ife brought it into the living room and took the lid off and said, Grandma, I need to put some medicine on your boo-boos. That poor little baby worried about my sores. <laughs> I mean, how do I explain to a three-year-old why I'm covered in sores? You know, that she's not going to understand. I keep telling her, well, it, it's mosquito bites that Grandma picked at, and, and I'll say, um, it's, um, you know, Grandma has a, a, a skin problem called eczema and you know it's little blisters and they pop and then they make sores but it's not I'm lying to her you know it's a mental illness I just can't stop it and, and it's worse during times of stress I just 
I just take all my anger and frustration and and stress out on my skin. And and if there's not a sore there, I will pick it and pick it until there is a sore. And I'm just so tired of it. But I can't stop. I have I take medicine for it. I take a hundred milligrams of Zoloft every day. I can't take more than that. That's the therapeutic dosage. I take a Seroquel, which I think it's an antipsychotic medicine, or I, I don't. It was, pre, it was prescribed for me off label because I have insomnia, something terrible. I can't even sleep an hour without it. And one of my psychiatrists at um, one of the rehabs that I was in in South Mississippi prescribed it for me to help me sleep because the side effect of Seroquel is sleepiness and it works wonders. I sleep like a baby and I would be dead without the Seroquel. I am down to just anywhere from 50. Sometimes I cut the 50 in half and I just take 25 at night because it, it causes severe um, dry mouth if, if I take more than you know 50. It's prescribed 100 milligrams but there's no way I could take 100. I wouldn't be able to even open my mouth the next day. I've been to, through therapy. I have I have dealt with the, the tragic death of my son, Jeremy. He was killed in a car crash in 1997 when he was 19 years old. I've dealt with that. I've, I've come to terms with it. Um, I know that's not the reason that I pick. I, I picked my skin long before Jeremy was ever even born. And it just has, it's a result of my childhood trauma and I can't make it go away. I can't, I wish I could take my brain out <laughs> and just wash away the bad experiences and, and just replace them with pleasant and, and happy memories and experiences. But um, I've been doing a lot of studying about it because I'm all about self-help and trying to help oneself instead of relying on medicine and therapy and, and things like that. But Dermatillomania is an excoriation disorder. It's related to OCD. And uh, trauma exposure has been found to pre trauma exposure has been found to precede OCD and a link between childhood trauma and skin picking. Well, I knew that. I didn't need uh, Google to uh, tell me that. But there's a traumatic events checklist. Um, I found it online, and there are just a few things that I wrote down. There are many, but the emotional abuse has to do with being belittled, teased, threatened verbally, unjustly punished by parents. That's the emotional abuse and emotional ne neglect, being left alone, being threatened. And those are just a few of the things that, that my mother put me through. Or I don't have the emotional trauma from the mistreatment that daddy put on me, um, that I do. Daddy's mistreatment was more physical abuse, whereas mother's mistreatment was the emotional. And uh, she did, you know, belittle me and call me names and threaten me. And you know, I tried, I tried to reconcile it and make excuses for her. Well, you know, her mother died when she was six, and her daddy remarried and she didn't like the old stepmother and then her daddy died when she was 10 and then she was shuffled off to her oldest sisters, her Aunt Bert and Aunt B. And so I've always made excuses for her and, and my sisters, Bobby and Angela, they, they make excuses for her and, you know, they love, they love mother and they don't suffer from the emotional trauma that I do. I don't know why, if, if mother's behavior was worse by the time I was born, or if, um, if the emotional, like mother's affairs and taking me with her, if maybe Bobby and Angie didn't see that much of it or you know, be there and experience as much of it as I did, but it, it was horrible. And it's still so vivid in my mind, everything that she did to me. And, you know, I was left alone a lot of times. She would take me with her and she would sneak off and meet her lover. 
and they would get a motel room. I don't know if there were two beds in there and if I slept in the other bed. Yeah, I, I know I was never sexually abused, you know, by one of mother's boyfriends. I know I would remember that. And I know I was a virgin. So I know that, you know, I was never experienced sexual abuse. It was just watching her and her interaction. And then the abuse that I had to suffer my mother would go out and raise the hood of the old Chevy and she knew how to disconnect the speedometers because daddy checked up on her. He would check the speedometer or the odometer to see how many miles she had put on the car that day. So she figured out a way to unhook the speedometer so that the odometer wouldn't add the miles onto the car. You know, so I had to go through that. I had to sit in the car and wait for mother to, to do that with the speedometer. And, and then go with her and you know this one guy and he lived out in the country and sometimes she would go to a payphone and call his house but if his wife answered mama would just hang up so she would just circle around his house for an hour or longer just hoping that he would see her and then get in his truck and then come meet her and usually he would and they would just you know, I'd be in the car with her and he would lean in the car and kiss her and they would talk and it was disgusting. I was about, I think it started when I was three or four years old and and it went on through, through the time that I was still a teenager. And this um, guy I was with before I was ever born, um, He's the one that she would um, take me and, and Bobby and, and get the Maggie, the one that I love so much, and she would take us with Maggie to the old zoo there in Lumberton. And um, it was called Kemper Park, and it, it had all these old baboons in it. I remember them baboons just turning up their old raw butts, and oh, it was so disgusting. I didn't want to go to that zoo, but you know, Mama would drop me and Maggie and Bobby off there, and she and this guy would go get a motel room or have sex in the car. I don't know what she did. But um, I asked my sister Angie, did she think that this James guy was my father? And she said, she said no. Um, but she kind of hesitated. And I, I do think that she knows more than what she's telling me. And I think my brother knew too. And neither one of them told me. Because after I found out his last name, um, Angie even sent me his obituary. When mama died, Angie got mama's photo album with all of her little, her scrapbook and everything in it. And mama had kept a lot of stuff about him. And he died young. I think he had a heart attack. So Angie had, sent me a screenshot of his obituary and he had two daughters so I found one of them on Facebook and she there's, there's a picture of her when she was about 12 years old y'all and she she and I looked just alike I would show y'all that picture but I know the trolls would do a search and, and find her and that picture that looks like me is is on her Facebook page and I don't want nobody to see that I definitely don't want her to know all of this about her daddy. But I just want I just want it to go away. I just, you know, it's so embarrassing. The, the reason they look so bad today is because I covered my arms and, you know, I took the cover cream and dabbed it all over the sores and rubbed it in real good so I could get in the kitchen and cook. It's embarrassing to, to try to make cooking videos and I have all these raw open sores on my arms Nobody wants to see that. That's disgusting. That's stomach churning. And and Suze, he wants to come see me. And I said, well, baby, I want to lose some weight. You know, I don't want you to see me this fat. Well, I'm the same size that I was when he came to see me three years ago. You know, it's nothing new. But when he came in uh, the end of October three years ago, uh, it was winter. I could wear, you know, long sleeve sweaters and he couldn't see the sores on my body. But it's summer now. I can't wear a sweater or a jacket to cover up my arms. So I told him, I said, I want to lose some weight. So I went on keto and I stayed on keto for 
the whole month of June and almost all of July, you know, putting him off. Don't, don't come yet. I want to lose some weight. I want to lose some weight. But the truth is, I don't want him to see these sores all over my body. It is just humiliating and gross. And I am so tired of it. And I don't know how to fix it. I just don't know how to fix it. Thank y'all so much for being here for me, for listening, and for loving me. Goodbye.